Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Nasha Mazar, and I am thrilled to have you join this webinar this morning about cross-linking approaches for keratoconus. Before introducing our phenomenal faculty, I wanted to share a little bit more information with you about what SightLife does. SightLife's mission is to eliminate corneal blindness by the year 2040. To begin, I want to thank Orbis for our long-standing partnership and be able to share with you more about our mission. I'll briefly walk through the five key programs of SightLife. The first program is advocacy and policy program work. This is to ensure that barriers to a successful health system are removed by advocating for governments and working with them to build policies that address access to care and ultimately increase the number of the corneas donated to ensure that the entire health system as a whole is working for the people in their community. The second program is prevention, treatment, and awareness programs. This program specifically helps prevent eye injuries from progressing into corneal blindness by working with community health workers and eye hospitals in very rural communities around the world. The third program is clinical training. This program provides high quality training on cornea care to ensure that there are qualified healthcare providers that are available to treat patients who ultimately need sight saving surgery as well as treatment. The fourth program is eye bank development. This program supports the eye banking ecosystem to ensure that eye banks are implementing best practices and functioning at high efficiency rates to provide tissue for transplants. Lastly, we work on bringing innovative solutions to improve access to high quality and affordable care by empowering local healthcare providers to treat their communities not only quicker, but more efficiently. Through these five key programs, we ensure that the entire health system is supported and self-sufficient to meet the needs of the entire country. Many of you joining today are clinical care providers and have a particular interest in learning about the clinical training program. Since the inception of this program in 2013, we've trained more than 1,400 ophthalmologists in low and middle income countries around the world. And the way we accomplish this is that we develop peer-reviewed curriculum for short-term cornea, corneal fellowships, um, various surgery techniques, including PK, DSEC, DMEC, and simple limbal, and for other ophthalmic personnel, including nurses, transplant coordinators, optometrists, and general ophthalmologists. Additionally, we are so fortunate to have SightLife's global faculty service coaches and mentors to hundreds of corneal surgeons and corneal care providers worldwide. Um, I am extremely lucky to be able to work with Dr. Bala Murali Ambati, who's based in uh, Eugene, Oregon in the United States at Pacific Clear Vision. Um, it's a, my pleasure to introduce him and have him share with you a little bit more about cross-linking approaches of keratoconus. My contact information is on the screen. Should you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And thank you so much. Without further ado, Dr. Bala Murali. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Nasha, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and um, I'm very happy to be here today. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, it's really an honor for me to uh, 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 be with you all today. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. I've been working with uh, Orbis uh, since uh, 2006 and with, Sight, uh, with SightLife since um, 2012, as I recall. Um, and today I'd like to speak with you about um, cross-linking approaches for keratoconus. Uh, there is a Q&A uh, portion in the uh, talk about halfway through. Uh, there will be some audience response questions that Lawrence will uh, do through Zoom and then show the results of the audience response and then I'll go through uh, the answers to those questions. Uh, separately, um, there's a chat box where uh, attendees can um, uh, post their questions and I'll address those uh, at the end. Um, so uh, let me get started. So uh, keratoconus uh, is a condition that uh, affects hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. and millions of patients worldwide. Uh, it remains the leading cause of cornea transplant in the U.S. Uh, and many other countries. Uh, because it really often affects the full thickness of the cornea. 
there's uh, posterior ectasia and bulging of the back of the cornea, and sometimes the decimase can rip, causing a corneal hydrops, and there can be anterior scarring and uh, stromal thinning through the uh, rest of the cornea. Um, this imposes a significant uh, economic burden on patients because they can't see well, they have reduced opportunities in education and work. And so this is a substantial burden to uh, patients that affects them over a very long period of time because onset is typically in the teenage or uh, early adulthood years. Crosslinking uh, has dramatically reduced the need for corneal transplantation. So the nations that have large corneal uh, registries uh, have demonstratively shown that the introduction of cross-linking has reduced um, the need for future PK in these patients uh, by 25 to 50 percent. Um, and that's because uh, the effects of cross-linking do tend to persist with significant corneal flattening uh, up to 10 years. So how did cross-linking all start? So it initially started with uh, Theo Seiler and Eberhard Sporl in uh, Dresden, Germany, who showed in 1998 that you could stiffen the cornea. And uh, 10 years later is when uh, the clinical trial got underway in the US uh, after substantial experience in uh, Europe. Um, and eight years after the clinical trial got underway in uh, the U.S. is when it got approved. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Peter Hirsch for the next several slides that will kind of go through the standard of care uh, or epithelial off cross-linking uh, that's uh, currently uh, the most commonly used technique. So these next several slides, uh, again, I want to thank Dr. Hirsch for sharing them with me, and they focus on use of the Avidro KXL system, which delivers 365 nanometer UVA light at a wattage of 3.0 milliwatts per centimeter squared. The indications uh, for cross-linking uh, in the US on the FDA approval side are patients greater than 14. Outside of the US, uh, patients much younger are being treated, I'm aware of patients who have been treated down to about age nine. It's really patient cooperation that uh, dictates whether um, it can be used or not. It's also indicated for the treatment of ectasia after LASIK or PRK. So uh, the EPI-OFF procedure, uh, which is the most commonly used form, involves removal of the central nine millimeters of epithelium. Uh, this can be done uh, using a spatula, alcohol, uh, a Moyle's brush, um, orca blade, anything that you use to remove corneal epithelium. Um, and then soaking the corneal stroma for about 30 minutes with one drop every two minutes. Um, then it's important to check for riboflavin uptake. So on this slip picture, you can see nice riboflavin uptake shown in green in the corneal stroma. Uh, it's uh, probably even easier to see this with blue light than with white light, but the effect is the same. You want to see riboflavin penetration into the deep corneal stroma before performing the surgery. Um, because you've scraped the cornea and left it open for 30 minutes, it is important to check the corneal thickness. If the corneal thickness remains over 400 microns, you can proceed with the cross-linking procedure. If at this point it's less than 400 microns, administer hypotonic riboflavin uh, until it swells to more than 400. And the reason this is important is that uh, riboflavin with UV light induces photooxidation. That's how it actually cross-links the amino acids of the corneal collagen. But oxidation, as you probably recall, can be toxic. Um, indeed, riboflavin kill, uh, UVA crosslinking kills corneal keratocytes. That's okay because the keratocytes recover. 
But if the corneal thickness is too thin, the riboflavin cross-linking procedure can actually kill corneal endothelial cells, which is not okay for this purpose, because although site life wants us to use more eye bank tissue, I'm sure they don't want us to uh, do unnecessary transplants. Um, and so the whole purpose of cross-linking is to avoid the need for transplantation. So it is very important to make sure that prior to applying the UV light, that your corneal thickness is more than 400 microns. Um, once that's done, then uh, proceed to centering the instrument, make sure you're in good focus and centration, and then you apply the UV light. Uh, continue with the riboflavin drops every couple of minutes, both to make sure there's enough riboflavin and that the cornea stays moist. Afterward, there'll be a bandage contact lens for about uh, five days, uh, antibiotic and corticosteroid, um, and um, that's the usual post-op protocol. So the next few slides are, for, are from Dr. Hirsch's uh, uh, clinical trial. This was the approval study for the Fotrexa product, which is the riboflavin uh, sold by Avidro. Um, and um, the top line result, uh, this is the primary efficacy endpoint set by the FDA, uh, was looking at KMAX change in treated versus placebo patients at one year. And as you'd expect, the placebo patients got worse over a year, and uh, as predicted, the cross-linking patients improved over one year. So this met the FDA benchmark, and uh, that's what enabled uh, uh, approval for this technology. In addition to the K-max effects, um, the asymmetry indices improved, uh, the higher order order aberrations of spherical aberration, coma and trefoil also improved. And so the quality of vision for these patients improved. Um, and this was reflected in improvements in uh, letters on the ETDRS scale of about uh, six letter improvement on corrected distance visual acuity and about uh, four and a half letter improvement on uncorrected distance visual acuity. Furthermore, uh, patient visual function, uh, my self-report questionnaire, uh, indicated reduced night driving, glare, halo, and starbursts, and all of these were significant. Um, out of the uh, 512 eyes that were uh, submitted uh, for the clinical trial approval, um, one patient had a corneal ulcer, um, about 57% uh, of patients developed haze at some point in the one year observation. So stromal haze is a very common effect of epi off cross linking. And uh, the time course usually is worst in the first three months. So if you look at these corneal OCT pictures, you'll see uh, stromal haze in the stroma down to about half depth or so. Um, and um, that is clinically relevant. These patients do have uh, visual disturbances from corneal haze for the first several months, but typically it goes away by six to 12 months. Um, we do like to look for the demarcation line uh, on corneal OCT that indicates the depth of the cross-linking effect, and that's usually visible on uh, swept source OCT at about 250 to 300 microns. So which patients are most likely to benefit from cross-linking? So um, the worse the KMAX is, the more likely they are to have um, flattening of the cornea. So when they looked in the clinical trial at the distribution of K-max uh, at one year after cross-linking, about three and a half patients, three and a half percent of patients actually did get worse. 
the vast majority had no change or improvement. And what they found in the subgroup analysis was that if Kmax was more than 55 diopters, these patients uh, were uh, fivefold more likely to flatten by two diopters at one year. Furthermore, um, the worse they start off in terms of vision, the more likely it is for them to have visual gain. So again, the vast majority of patients uh, or the plurality of patients have no change in visual acuity. A fair proportion have improvement and about three and a half percent of patients did lose some vision with uh, the cross-linking procedure. Um, so the purpose of treatment is to stabilize the disease, minimize the loss of visual acuity, and uh, normalize the corneal topography. Um, you do have to advise the patients that they're not going to get better immediately. Their KMAX actually got worse in the first month, and then slowly over the next year, it improved. And based on the European data, this improvement continues somewhat up to about two years. So what are the challenges? So as I mentioned to, to you, cross-linking involves scraping the cornea. You're causing a complete corneal abrasion. So all these patients have pain for several days, maybe a week or two. Um, because you have an open corneal stroma, there is some infection risk. These patients need antibiotics until the epithelium is closed. Um, the majority of patients do develop corneal haze. A small proportion develop scarring, but generally with adequate treatment of the haze with steroids, you can prevent scarring and clear the cornea within a few months. The vision changes. Uh, visual fluctuation is common up to a year. Uh, in the US system, insurance coverage uh, remains a challenge. And because the cornea has a lot of inflammation at the time of the surgery with the corneal debridement, you can't do intacts at the same time. You generally have to do that at a different date. Um, and intacts uh, is a very nice uh, procedure to have in your keratoconus uh, uh, toolkit because that will have substantial reduction of corneal astigmatism. So if you feel that the patient needs both epi off cross-linking and intax in both eyes, that's four procedures and four post-op sets of visits. Um, and so that requires a lot of patient commitment. Um, and so that needs a, a, lot, a good discussion before embarking on therapy. So, um, as an overall framework for keratoconus therapy, I think the most important thing you can advise your patients is to stop eye rubbing. Um, I actually uh, tell the loved one of the patient that they can charge the patient a dollar every time they rub their eyes. And that's a very good way of getting the patient to uh, stop their eye rubbing habits. Um, if they have allergies, give eye drops for the allergies. Talk to them about cold compresses. Talk to them about if they do need to rub, use the finger pad rather than the knuckle. Uh, a lot of these patients, if you ask them to show you how they rub their eyes, they use their knuckles and really, you know, press on their cornea. And that knuckle is, you know, is bone. The cornea is not. And so you want them to get to stop them from using their knuckles to rub their eyes. Um, I find intacts to be incredibly helpful in normalizing the contour and reducing astigmatism and myopia, and cross-linking stops progression. So the purpose of cross-linking is to keep it from getting worse. The purpose of intacts is to hopefully improve the corneal symmetry. Um, it is very valuable to work with an optometrist who's experienced in keratoconus therapy, someone who can do piggyback lenses or hybrid lenses or scleral lenses or soft torx, because these can make a huge difference to patients. For um, advanced disease, they may still need a transplant, either a PK or a DALC. Um, and before embarking on therapy, understand that this is not your typical LASIK or cataract patient where you do the procedure, they're happy within a day or two, and life is grand. 
this is a patient that you're going to get to know very well over the next several years. So you need to advise them that their expectations cannot be a goal of 2020 uncorrected. Many times keratoconus patients have been struggling with their contacts, struggling with their glasses, struggling with their vision and life. They come in looking for LASIK. You tell them they can't have LASIK, but they should get cross-linking. That's medically right. But in their mind, they're thinking your cross-linking is going to fix their vision, especially if they're paying thousands of dollars for that. And so they have expectations that you need to reset. They cannot be allowed to proceed to surgery with LASIK expectations because this is not LASIK. And so you really need to emphasize to them the purpose of therapy now is to keep them from needing a cornea transplant in the future and hopefully we'll improve their vision somewhat. Hopefully we can improve their contact lens tolerance in somewhat, but this is not about getting them out of glasses or contacts to a 2020 uncorrected endpoint. So that reset of expectations has to be set at the very start in the informed consent process. So that's the standard of care approved uh, cross-linking. What I'd like to share with you today uh, for the next uh, part of the talk is our uh, IRB approved uh, clinical trial. And that's a phase one, two A study that uses um, epi on cross-linking with uh, pulsation and an accelerated protocol. Uh, this is using the Peschke uh, PXL330 uh, device. Um, I am a consultant for Peschke, so I should disclose that. Um, the uh, research, however, has not been uh, sponsored uh, by Peschke. Um, the uh, objectives of this investigator-initiated uh, clinical trial in our practice are to look at the treatment of uh, keratoconus and post eczema ectasia. Um, and uh, this is a bit of a different protocol. You know, we do the same loading of riboflavin before uh, the surgery, but there's no scraping. There's no epithelial debridement. Um, and this is enabled because uh, the riboflavin solution comes in a trans-epithelial uh, formulation. So there's um, additives in the riboflavin formulation that enable it to cross the epithelium without removing the epithelium. Um, I adjust the aperture size of the uh, cross-linking light to the cone. So based on topography, I might change the cone, ap uh, the, the aperture of the cross-linking to uh, from nine millimeters down to eight or seven or six millimeters. So I'll shrink the cross-linking light to where the uh, treatment needs to be applied. So very often I decenter the treatment somewhat inferotemporally to apply the UV light to the ectatic cornea. Um, and uh, the nice feature with this trial is that we can apply uh, 30 milliwatts for 10 minutes in pulsed fashion, five seconds on, five seconds off. So this is a much faster treatment rather than a 30 minute per eye treatment, it's only a 10 minute treatment. And um, using the pulsing allows the cornea to reoxygenate, and so we do deliver oxygen by blow by, and that extra oxygen facilitates the cross linking photo oxidation. Afterward, uh, we do uh, a combination Predgatti, uh, prednisolone, and gatafloxacin eye drop. Um, I do prednisone for a few days in some patients, but not all. Um, generally, I'll reserve this for patients who've had uh, ocular surface disease or are at risk for ocular surface inflammation, but most of the time this is not necessary. It is important for them to wear sunglasses, um, and if the patient has pain, they can get Percocet for a couple of days, but generally most patients don't need anything more than Tylenol or Ibuprofen. Um, I do put a soft contact at the time with an estimate of as to what their myopic correction needs to be. 
Um, I'm not gonna go through all the inclusion and exclusion criteria, but with this protocol, we can treat down to uh, age 12. Um, and um, we don't really have to worry about corneal thickness so much because we're uh, not removing the cornea. So as long as the total corneal, or removing the corneal epithelium. So as long as the total corneal pachymetry is more than 400 microns, then we can proceed with this Epion uh, protocol. Patients who have prior herpes or acanthamoeba or scarring are not eligible for the uh, uh, cross-linking because uh, the UV light can sometimes reactivate those um, uh, pathogens. Um, and obviously, if they have some other chronic disease that affects healing, such as poorly controlled diabetes or non-compliance, we may uh, not enroll them in the study. So, so far, uh, we've treated uh, 28 eyes, um, 16 with cross-linking alone, 12 with intacts and cross-linking. There have been no adverse events and there's been no loss of best corrected visual acuity. Um, about 11 patients, 11 eyes have completed one year of follow-up. Uh, one patient and one eye did require retreatment uh, due to progression. Um, and uh, let me go through what we have at the one year, uh, uh, six month and one year follow-up data. So um, the patients who underwent cross-linking and intox, um, there was a substantial improvement in uncorrected visual acuity. And that's to be expected. Intax dramatically decreases uh, corneal astigmatism. So that helps their uncorrected visual acuity. In addition, there was about 10 letter improvement on the ETDRS uh, best corrected visual acuity. On the cross-linking only group, um, there was still a visual acuity improvement, uh, both on uncorrected as well as about three letters of improvement on the ETDRS scale. Visual concerns by patients did decline uh, in terms of those self-reported night uh, starbursts and halos and so on. Um, after the initial procedure, there was a slight increase in uh, the KMAX uh, with the intax patients. And the reason that's occurring is intax is displacing that cone from the infrotemporal cornea and it's displacing that towards the center. So we expect that, um, but then it stabilizes. The uh, cross the only group also had stabilization of the KMAX. Um, so I'm gonna go share with you some uh, comparison reports. So this is a very useful technology that's available on both the Galilei from Zemer and the Pentacam from Oculus. So you can compare the corneal topography before surgery, after surgery, and then do a comparison report. Um, and so uh, this patient was initially evaluated in August of 2017. And this is two years later, their topography. And what you'll see is this is not a curative procedure for keratoconus, but their KMAX substantially reduced from 61.3 to 52. And so there's a dramatic normalization of the corneal contour all across the cornea such that it's much less asymmetric. So this is the effect that can be seen a couple of years after the procedure. And this, um, uh, next patient, uh, very similar effect. Also, uh, this is the uh, other eye of, of that same patient, um, uh, August 17th to December 19th. So both eyes were treated, and this uh, initial crab claw pattern, again, uh, less corneal steepening uh, two and a half years after the procedure compared to the start, and the KMAX is substantially reduced. Um, this next patient, uh, this is about a year uh, after treatment, June of 2017 to July of 2018. You can see the effect of what the intax and cross-linking did was to uh, substantially reduce the size of the cone um, as well as the steepness of the cone. Um, so again, this patient was 
not able to tolerate a soft contact lens, but was seeing a lot better uh, and able to tolerate a soft contact lens after treatment. Um, these effects do take time to build. So this patient, we only have um, eight months of follow-up so far. And at eight months, there is reduction of the cone size and flattening of the cone, but it's only been eight months, so we're not seeing as much effect as on the prior two cases where we had two and a half years of follow-up or a year of follow-up. And this matches the long-term literature uh, shown in Europe where uh, after cross-linking, you do, you do have this disease-modifying effect where you take the patient off of a corneal steepening pathway and put them on a corneal flattening pathway that tends to progress and get better over time. All right, so here we'll do a little pause. I'll do a little uh, Q&A session. So this is where um, uh, I'll ask a question um, and then uh, Lawrence will put a audience response question on the uh, screen and uh, we'd love to hear everyone's responses and then I'll go through the answer. So question one, uh, which of the following is not a Robinowitz criteria, uh, Yaron Robinowitz uh, developed the first criteria for, uh, set of criteria for keratoconus. And so the choices are mean keratometry more than 47.2, inferior superior asymmetry more than one and a half diopters, inter eye difference of mean keratometry more than a diopter, or skewing of radial axis less than 20 degrees. Which of these is not a criteria for keratoconus? So if everyone can uh, take a little bit of time and choose their answer and then hit submit, then um, Lawrence will be able to collate the data and show us the uh, um, audience poll and then I'll go to the answer and explanation. Okay, so uh, the plurality said uh, skewing of radial axis less than 20 degrees. So that is correct. The classic criteria for keratoconus based on topography are a steep cornea, mean K more than 47.2, um, inferior superior asymmetry more than one and a half diopters, so that's just saying the inferior cornea is steeper than the superior cornea, um, and then a difference in the Ks between the two eyes. Um, if that's more than a diopter, that is one of the criteria for keratoconus. Um, Skewing refers to, is it a symmetric bow tie or an asymmetric bow tie? If the steep uh, axes are more than 20 degrees off, that points you towards keratoconus. If the steep axes of the cornea are symmetric or less than 20 degrees uh, skewed from each other, then that's within the range of normal. So that's the first question. And so again, this is the classic Rabinowitz criteria. Um, and this presentation is being recorded and everyone can have the slides after the talk. Um, question two, uh, in the Randleman Ectasia risk scoring system, which of the following adds no risk of corneal ectasia uh, in patients who are being considered for uh, LASIK? So the Randleman Ectasia Risk scoring system refers to LASIK uh, uh, candidates. Um, and so the uh, potential choices are uh, pachymetry of 520 microns, age of 18, residual stromal bed of 270, and correction of minus 9.5 diopters. Which of the following adds no risk of ectasia? So if you can take a few seconds and submit your answer, we'll get the audience poll. Perfect. So the plurality said a pachymetry of 520 microns, and that is the correct answer. Um, so let's go through those Randleman criteria. So Brad Randleman, who was at Emory previously, uh, so, uh, published this uh, risk scoring uh, protocol for patients uh, coming in for uh, examination for LASIK. So um, he assigns points to different features. Um, and if you have four or more points, don't perform LASIK. Um, if you have three points, um, that would push you towards 
proceeding with caution, maybe do PRK, um, and then think about the whole picture. Um, uh, zero to two points is low risk, and you can proceed with refractive surgery. So the interesting things about these point system is the following. Um, on the age criteria, the only way to have zero points for age is if you're more than 30. So this is an important point. Keratoconus occurs in the teenage, or presents itself in the teenage years or 20s. So if you do LASIK on a 20 year old, they could get keratoconus when they're 27. That doesn't mean you cause the LASIK. You, 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 that doesn't mean you cause the keratoconus by doing the LASIK because they could have developed keratoconus anyway. So until you get to age 30, you don't actually know the natural history of a person's cornea. That's the point of this age criteria. So that yes, you can do LASIK in the 20s, but you just don't know the natural history because the cornea is a dynamic living tissue. And only until you get to 30, only after you get to 30 is when you're confident that they're not gonna get keratoconus just because they have whatever gene for it. Um, residual stromal bed. For a long time, we used to say 250 microns was our hard deck. The flap and the ablation, you should leave 250 microns. And that's actually not true. It's more of a spectrum effect. Um, and so over time, uh, as a field, we've come to a hard deck of 300 microns. And so the more and more you go underneath 300 microns, the more and more points you get on risk for ectasia development. Um, corneal thickness, more than 510, there's no um, uh, additional risk. And the thinner you get, the more points on ectasia risk that you get. And then in terms of manifest refraction, um, in terms of how much ablation you do, uh, more than eight diopters, you get eight to 10 diopters, you get one point. More than 10 diopters, you get two points. I don't really know anyone doing more than 10 diopters of correction. So I think the rest of this is fairly moot. Um, and then as far as topography, this is really a subjective judgment on uh, the um, part of the uh, cornea specialist looking at the topographer. There are indices given by the Pentacam with the uh, Balin Ambrosia display or the BAD index, and on the Galilei with the CLMIX, the Cone Location Magnitude Index. And those are helpful in terms of giving you some quantitative metrics for keratoconus risk. But at the end of the day, it's you as the surgeon deciding, is this bow tri is asymmetric? Is there skewing of the radial axis? Is there inferior steepening? and so on. And so those are the things to look for on corneal topography. And that's just a function of experience, looking at lots of normal topos and looking at abnormal topos. All right, question three. Which of the following poses a significant risk of ectasia? Uh, this is in the context of doing uh, LASIK. So uh, an 80 micron ablation after a 100 micron flop in a 550 micron thick cornea, um, 140 micron ablation after 110 micron flop in a 500 micron thick cornea, um, a 60 micron ablation after 120 flop in a 600 micron thick cornea, uh, or a 140 micron ablation after 120 micron flop in a 600 micron thick cornea. So which poses a significant risk of ectasia? That is the correct answer. Um, so this goes to the percent thick, uh, tissue altered formula. Um, so I mentioned to you classically, it used to be 250 micron uh, hard deck. Now it's like a 300 micron hard deck, but an even more stringent formula to know and be aware of is the PTA formula, which basically says the flap thickness plus the ablation depth should be no more than 40% of the central corneal thickness. So that is to say, after, flap thick, after the flap and ablation depth, you should have 60% of the cornea remaining. Um, and depending on the patient, 
um, this interacts with the Munnerlin formula. So the larger the optical zone, the more ablation per diopter. So depending on the patient, if you can go to a smaller optical zone and save significant amounts of cornea to stay above the 60% corneal thickness residual that you want to keep. So when you're planning your refractive surgery plans for LASIK or PRK patients, pay attention to the PTA formula. The flap and the ablation should be less than 40% of the central corneal thickness and pay attention to the Munnerlin formula, which affects the ablation uh, di um, microns per diopter based on optical zone. If you're doing PRK rather than LASIK, there's no flap, but you are removing the epithelium. So in that context, rather than FT in this formula, I put in 55 microns. That's a general average for uh, corneal epithelial thickness. If you do happen to have a OptoView or an ARC scan uh, or a CSO MS39, those are instruments that can measure uh, corneal epithelial thickness centrally and you can get an epithelial thickness map. You can plug that in, uh, but those instruments aren't that common yet. All right, last audience response question. Um, Cross-linking would not be indicated in which of the following situations. A 25-year-old with keratoconus who's had one doctor of steepening over the last six months, a 15-year-old with keratoconus who's experienced half a doctor of steepening over the last four months, uh, a 30-year-old with keratoconus and scarring from high drops, um, or a 25-year-old with a superficial bacterial ulcer not responding to antibiotics. In which of those situations is cross-linking not indicated? And that is the correct answer, uh, the patient with the high drops. Um, and the reason for that is if you have a high drops and corneal scarring, this person's going to need a transplant. Cross-linking isn't gonna help them. All of the other patients, they have progression, they should be cross-linked, and the person with the superficial ulcer not responding to antibiotics, if you can kill the bacteria with cross-linking, go for it. So I'd um, like to uh, share uh, a couple of cases here. Um, so you know, what do you think happened as well as uh, how would you manage? So normally I do this in the context of a small group. Uh, this really doesn't, um, with you know, hundreds of participants, we can't do that. But so I'll, I'll just present the topography, uh, kind of share my thoughts and, um, and then uh, we'll go from there. And whatever questions you have, you can uh, put in the chat box and we can review. So this person, uh, was about 70 years old. They came in for their cataract evaluation, but they had PRK about 24 years ago. Um, and they had PRK that was a minus 24 ablation a long time ago. You can see a very thin cornea here, down to about 121 microns centrally, the thinnest point is 98 microns. We did cornea OCT. Initially, we didn't believe this. We did cornea OCT, and the thinnest point on the cornea on the OCT centrally was about 130 microns. So we actually do believe that this cornea is super thin based on the slit lamp exam, the cornea OCT, and the strength fluid photography. So what should we do? I talked to this person extensively about doing a PK and cataract or triple procedure. Um, he uh, was doing reasonably well with contact lenses with a hard contact lens until his cataract got bad. So he asked if we could just do the cataract um, and we did. So uh, my fellow uh, Dr. Hubble and I uh, uh, did the procedure and we um, used a my loop to chop up the cataract uh, into small pieces to minimize how much time the phaco probe was inside the eye. You know, obviously, we wanted to spend as little time inside the eye because we did not want this paper thin part of the cornea to burst. So the person's a couple weeks out, of, uh, out from surgery so far doing well. And uh, uh, you know, we, we uh, lucked out by not having to do a PK. 
Um, okay, this next uh, uh, patient um, is uh, someone with keratoconus. You can see this inferotemporal cone. They have a plus 550, minus 950 uh, prescription. And so uh, what we did was to do a single segment intax of 450 microns and center it on the cone. And so uh, the cone is over here, uh, the posterior part of the cone, and I want to displace that. And what you'll often notice is that the axis of the cone actually ma matches the flat axis of the astigmatism. And that's where you want to put your intacts. You want to put the intacts, displace the cone centrally, and change the flat axis of the cornea uh, so that the cornea is more symmetric. You're taking a cornea that's a cone and putting an underwire to make it more round. Um, this next person was also severe keratoconus, uh, but rather than a hyperopic sphere, they had a very significant myopic sphere, um, but they had a lot of astigmatism, eight diopters. So similar strategy, we put a single segment intax here to debulk the astigmatism, and then put a minus 14 contact lens, soft contact lens, and they were very happy with it. So uh, um, again, what you'll notice is the cone displacement on the posterior side matches the flat axis of the cylinder. Um, and so you're trying to normalize the cornea by putting an intax, symmetrizing the cornea to reduce the astigmatism. And this person who could not tolerate a soft contact lens or a hard contact lens afterward is now functioning very nicely with a minus 14 soft lens. Um, so this is, both of the last procedures were intax and cross-linking. Um, this is the CLMIX map uh, that I showed to you. Uh, the Balin Ambrosia display on the Pentacam is similar. It shows all of the indexes that the computer uses and the probability of keratoconus is 100%. So this is just an interesting map uh, that I encourage you to play with on your Shine Fluke photographers to get used to this uh, uh, type of uh, presentation. Um, and on the asymmetry report, uh, we look for the CLMI index, 9.33, and um, and that's what we change over time. Um, so this last uh, case that I want to show is a person with a minus 7, minus 250. So here there's some astigmatism, but the main problem is myopia. So we did a double intax with cross-linking, uh, asymmetric intax, uh, 450 over here and 210 over there. By having a double intax, you can uh, reduce the myopia substantially, but uh, by having asymmetry, you can treat the astigmatism um, and get the person into a soft contact lens. Um, so this was the plan. Uh, we did a 450 here, a 210 there, and we're trying to center the cone, treat both myopia and astigmatism. All right, so let's see how many questions I can get through. I, I wanna thank everyone for their odd, uh, attention. So let's go through the questions. Um, Dr. Kamar asked, in what age can I do cross-linking lower limit? I would say um, um, uh, down to about age 10. Um, in our protocol, we do age 12. I do know uh, physicians who have done it down to um, uh, age 9. Really is dependent on uh, patient cooperation. Um, there are even reports of uh, Down syndrome children who have been put to general anesthesia and then underwent cross-linking. Um, uh, you know, at you know in the you know less than ten uh, age group. So um, if you have the setup to do general and you want to go younger, you can. Um, uh, but you know that's uh, up to you. You have to really look and see how well the parents can manage that child afterward. 
Um, next question. Once you do cross-linking, how much time do you wait to see a reduction in the cylinder or when can we fit contact lenses? Great question. So I put on a bandage contact lens that's a soft lens with what I predict to be the myopic uh, power needed. About two weeks later, um, I'll fine-tune it. And then about a month after that, I'll get them to the contact lens specialist to uh, try to do a soft toric if necessary. So um, you can fit the contact lens on the day of the surgery. I would fine tune it a little bit with the contact lens over refraction a couple of weeks later, and then get them back to the optometrist to do further fits over the next several months, because it is going to change. It's going to change for a couple of years. And so um, I try to do a couple of fine tunes in the first couple of months and then let the optometrist adjust things every six months for the next two years. Uh, what are the criteria for selection of patients for C3R? So takeaway messages. If you have a person with uh, keratoconus progression, they should be cross-linked. Any age, if they have progression, you're seeing the topos get worse, their stigmatism is getting worse, do the cross-linking. You want to stop progression. Now, if it's a young patient and you don't have prior topographies, you know, let's say they're less than 25, certainly less than 20, they have a 99% chance of progression. And so I don't think you need to wait in a young patient to do cross-linking because you know they're going to progress. After cross-linking, is there effect on transparency of the cornea? This is from Dr. Sink. If you have epi off cross-linking, yes. More, the majority of patients are going to get haze that resolves over about six to 12 months. Epi on cross-linking, generally there's no haze. Um, Next question, Dr. Agarwal, what is the minimum age? We've talked about this already. I would go down to uh, probably age 10 personally. Some people have gone down to age nine. Um, next question, which is better, riboflavin with or without dextran? The purpose of uh, not having dextran is to have hypotonic solutions. So the hypotonic solutions don't have dextran that swells the cornea. The dextran is there normally just to keep it an isotonic solution. So it depends on the corneal thickness whether you want dextran or not. So look at the Fotrexa formula um, or the Peschke formulas and see whether you need a hypotonic solution or not. Uh, next question, how does it affect post-op corneal thickness? What we've seen um, is a slight reduction. The corneal collagen crossings, it becomes more compact. So at about one year, there's probably about a five micron reduction in central corneal thickness. Uh, next question, uh, repeat cross thinking and how early can we repeat? Um, if you see uh, worsening at six months or nine months, I would repeat it. Um, uh, and the indications for repeat therapy are progression. So uh, you want to follow these patients with regular corneal topographies and see, are, is their astigmatism getting worse? Is their K-max getting worse? Um, as far as uh, how often to advise topography, I would probably do it at least every six months. In our clinical trial, we're doing it at every study visit, but uh, for if you're not in a clinical trial, um, I would do the topography at least every six months. Next question, what is the minimal thickness? If you're doing epi on cross-linking, in our protocol, it's 400 microns. If you're doing epi off cross-linking, um, if the uh, cornea is between 300 to 400 microns, you want to swell it with hypotonic solution and then uh, get it above 400 to do the cross-linking. Um, and the, yes, the protocol is the same in the post-refractive ectasia. Okay, uh, next questioner, Dr. Uh, Morteza Fart. Do you recommend cross-linking for the second eye of a keratoconus patient if uncorrected vision is 20-20? So if you have a patient who is having progression on topography, um, their cornea is getting worse their asymmetry, their cone, talk to them. This is not just about 2020. Very often they'll tell you they're having difficulty with their sight, night driving or glare or whatever you know, task they do. Just because uncorrected visual acuity is 2020, we all know that keratoconus patients have a very good visual brain. Keratoconus patients can sit there at the Sonoma eye chart 
if we give them enough time, they can get an extra line or two. They're not reading fast, but they can make things up because their visual brain is better than the average patient. Um, and so it's not just about 2020, it's about does the patient notice progression? Are you seeing progression on the topography? Um, and if the answer is yes, I would encourage them to have cross-linking, um, even if their uncorrected vision is 2020, with an informed consent about the risks of surgery. Um, next uh, question, no rub, no cone. Well, rubbing is probably the biggest risk factor for keratoconus, um, um, but there are patients who don't rub and still get keratoconus. Um, next question from Dr. Ula, if one eye is 20-20 and no cylinder, um, and they have a visual acuity one month and eight diopter cylinder, fundus is normal, any need to do cross-linking? So uh, this is hard to realize without checking topos over time. Is there progression or not? So if there's no progression, then you don't need cross-linking. If there is progression, then do the cross-linking. This particular patient, it looks like eight doctors of cylinder is the main issue. So Intax is probably going to give you a much better effect than cross-linking. Uh, Sherry Morgan, coming from a public health background, um, are there current estimates of global burden? Can you see cross-linked scale up on a global scale? Um, well, um, you know, there are many cross-linking manufacturers out there. Um, uh, New World and Peshki and several others have very affordable units. Riboflavin outside the U.S. should be very affordable. So yes, I do see cross-linking scaled up. Um, and it does require uh, follow-up and compliance, of course, as does any surgical procedure. Uh, next slide from, uh, uh, next question, uh, Dr. Tamalskova. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Tamalkowska. Um, when patients have keratoconus and one eye has done cross-linking and the other eye has borderline values, should we perform cross-linking immediately? I would check the patient over time and see if the other eye progresses. If it does not, then observe. If it is progressing, then do the cross-linking. And so in that situation, I'd probably do a repeat topography at three months or four months in a younger patient. If they're you know, over 30 or over 40, maybe every six months. Uh, what is the importance of warming alcohol? I don't. Uh, next question, what is our approach for post dalk atasia? Um, so keratoconus can recur either with a PK or dalk. If you're seeing recurrence uh, after PK or dalk, um, generally that's because of incomplete removal of the peripheral infrotemporal tissue. So when I do transplant on these patients, I'm doing a large transplant and uh, very often I'm decentering the removal, the trephination, so that I'm getting that peripheral infrotemporal diseased tissue. Um, and when they recur, what you'll notice is that that wasn't done. And so they actually had some remaining keratoconus tissue left. These patients tend to come back years later and they have this recurrence. Um, if they're no longer contact lens tolerant, you can actually do thermal keratoplasty, the handheld cautery, a little zapping on the apex of that peripheral rim and a little bit of heat scars that uh, peripheral rim and then you can get them into a contact lens. How much time between cross-linking and, and uh, intacts? This is from Dr. Viscara. Uh, I try to do them at the same time because I can't with epi on cross-linking. If you're doing epi off cross-linking, I'd wait at least two or three months to do the intacts. Order doesn't matter. Uh, you can do either one first. Um, next slide. Uh, next question, uh, Dr. Pandya. When we're doing LASIK with cross-linking, should we do simultaneously? Um, if you're doing LASIK extra, I have not done this, but if you're doing LASIK extra, I would do the flap, do the ablation, do the cross-linking on the stromal bed, then put the flap back on, um, or put the flap back on and then do the cross-linking. A lot of it depends on the remaining corneal thickness, but I would do it simultaneously. What's the highest Kmax deemed acceptable for crossing? This, I would really rephrase the question, what's the minimum corneal thickness? You know, when you get into corneas above 70 diopters, most of those patients probably have a lot of corneal thinning and probably need a transplant. 
Um, so I've gone up to 68 or 69 doctors. Um, next question from Dr. Wakwe. How soon can one who had cross-linking uh, use RB, RGP lens? Uh, if it's epi off cross-linking, I wait until the epithelium heals and stabilizes, so at least a couple of weeks. Um, next question, Dr. Alvera, if the keratoconus is stable, does the patient need a cross-linking? Probably not. The purpose is to stop progression. What is the thinnest packing? Um, minimum, at least 400. Um, if you have sub 400 micron uh, cross-linking, you want to swell the cornea to get it above 400. Um, uh, next question, Dr. Lee, least time for follow-up to detect progression. You can often detect progression within three or four months. Just a few more questions, home stretch here. Dr. Aratanong, uh, if the patient's age 35, uh, when can they get external lens after cross-linking? Um, probably a, a couple of months. Um, you know, I, I'd probably wait at least a couple of months for the cornea to get to a relative area of stability. Do you recommend lubricating eye drops from Dr. Bondre? Yes. Uh, what's the maximum age of patients for cross-linking? Um, there is no maximum age. If you have an older patient, 55 or 60, who's having progression, do the cross-linking. It's rare, but I would do it, even though they have progression. How long should we wait postpartum? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, uh, I'd wait probably at least a couple of months. Um, Dr. Ola, my patient is six years old. Can they do cross-linking? I can, I suppose. Um, I would you know, look at doing general anesthesia and doing it in an operating room in that context. Uh, but you know, I, I think that would be a long discussion with the parents. Um, criteria for PK and post cross linking Well, the, that's the same criteria as for any PK. How bad is the vision and can a PK help? Um, and then do you recommend contact lens assisted cross linking for a thin cornea? I have not done that. Um, Dr. Graue in Mexico would be a good resource for that. Um, and then last question, uh, 420 CCT with keratoconus. Well, if there's progression, then yes. Um, and then Dr. Kamari, uh, patient uh, got diabetic retinopathy after injection. Uh, well, they should be treated for the diabetic retinopathy. It doesn't sound like this person has keratoconus. So I would get them to the retina specialist. Um, so with that, I think we've done the, the, you know, the blitz of answering questions, uh, uh, the, the, the speed question session. So thank you all very, very much. Oh, there's one more. Is it a disease of myopia or hyperopia? You can have it with either. I've had hyperopes with a lot of keratoconus, uh, uh, astigmatism, and they're hyperopic. So that depends on not just the cornea, but also the axial length. So. Thank you all very much. You all have a wonderful day. It was a pleasure.